I don't know whether it's a blessing to be last on this panel or not. I won't say it's a pleasure for me to be here. It is. But what I want to say first is congratulations to the state of California and to California public librarians for being a leading community in supporting literacy in libraries. I think that the record that you've just heard from Susan and Gary uh, clearly document the leadership that you have exerted in, uh, in the area of literacy. I wasn't aware that my uh, bio would be in your packet, which is why I said in my handout that uh, I'm a librarian by training and choice. Um, I've had so many non-library jobs in my life, many people don't uh, realize that I am a librarian. Um, in fact, I started out on the technical side of libraries. I'm, I'm a cataloger. Uh, an acquisition specialist and a system specialist. But then I moved into management and discovered policy. <laughs> well, I've been an advocate for literacy for a number of years, and I can, I can count back to my first introduction uh, to literacy services in libraries as a policy area. When I was executive director of the American Library Association in the 1970s, I realized that libraries were sponsoring literacy programs uh, and were struggling hard to get the public to understand how important literacy programs were to their constituencies. So I had the bright idea that I would go to the Advertising Council and ask them if they wouldn't be willing to sponsor a public awareness campaign on adult literacy. Well, uh, through some uh, colleagues in the publishing industry, I was able to get an appointment to meet with the executive committee of the Ad Council, and I went there in my best suit and uh, my best presentation to talk to them about the advantages of supporting a public awareness campaign for literacy. Well, I met all of these blank stares, and finally, when I had finished my presentation, one of them piped up and said, is there really a literacy problem in the United States? And I was shocked. But of course, we continued the conversation, and they were very polite to me um, since I had been referred to them by several heads of major publishing houses. They didn't want to dismiss me out of hand. Uh, but what they said was that if you could go out and get several other educational organizations to endorse um, this uh, campaign that you're proposing, then we will certainly consider it. And it was on the basis of that interview that I um, asked uh, 10 other organizations to join the ALA in forming the Coalition for Literacy. And we went back to the Ad Council, and they agreed to sponsor the first ever public awareness campaign on uh, literacy. Uh, Ted Bell, who was then the uh, commissioner and actually the first secretary of, uh, of education um, in our country, recruited Barbara Bush as the principal spokesperson for that uh, campaign, and some of you may remember that campaign that ran in the early 80s. Well, I didn't consider myself a literacy specialist, so I went back to work with libraries, and over 30 years later, when I um, retired from the university and decided that I wanted to volunteer in the literacy movement and got back involved with uh, then Laubach literacy, it seemed as if we hadn't moved. Uh, you had the same public awareness pro uh, problem that I had seen in the 1970s. So that's sort of a history of how I came into being um, an advocate for literacy and why over the last six plus years I've been working with Proliteracy Worldwide uh, to um, uh, be a more vocal advocate for literacy. Uh, Proliteracy Worldwide was formed in 2002 by merging Literacy Volunteers of America with Laubach Literacy International. These are the two uh, largest uh, nonprofit, non-governmental literacy uh, training organizations in our country. Uh, it so happened they were both located in the same city in Syracuse, New York. It seemed very strange. Across town from each other, they're both doing virtually the same thing. And I said, this doesn't make any sense. So we were able to get the two groups to agree to merge, and we merged officially in 2002. Fundamentally, Proliteracy Worldwide is a foundation. We provide small operating grants and do training uh, to non-governmental uh, partner organizations 
in about 62 developing countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East. We're a publisher. We're the largest nonprofit publisher of learning materials, primarily for adults, in the United States. Uh, you can go to our website, and you should be familiar with this, because we are a major resource for the kinds of learning materials that you want to provide to adult learners, including teenage uh, learners. Uh, we provide uh, materials that support basic literacy. We have several different basic um, reading series, starting with people who are at the lowest level of reading skill. And uh, we provide uh, GED materials. Uh, we also provide uh, English as a second or other language materials to support local literacy programs. We're a technical assistance agency for giving advice on how to start maintain and improve uh, literacy programs at the local level. And we, of course, are an international association because we don't send uh, our people directly to start and maintain programs in other countries. We train local people in those countries. And currently, we work with 120 local organizations uh, who operate uh, literacy programs in the areas that I previously outlined. We're primarily an adult literacy agency. I say primarily because we support programs that are involved with family literacy. We support programs that are involved in teaching uh, children as one of the components of their uh, local program. But our special view is that there are many, many thousands of programs that are devoted to children's literacy and very few devoted to adult literacy. And let me just start by giving you a little quiz to try to reinforce the importance of this particular perspective on literacy in our country. Um, <clears throat> the, the success of a child in learning and being successful in reading is dependent upon A, um, a well-funded uh, school library, B, the education of the parents. C, the percentage of teachers who make state qualifications. Which one do you think is the most? <laughs> education of the parents is clearly the, the best indicator of how successful a child will be in school. Now, we just had the release of a major survey in December of 2005 that Susan referred to earlier, the National uh, Assessment of Adult <coughs> Literacy. Now, that assessment said that, um, that there were people at or below basic literacy levels. And let's talk about the numbers. Do you think that number of people at or below basic, liberal, uh, basic literacy levels was 30 million, 60 million, or 90 million? 90. 90. Over 90 million adults in the United States. Now, that's out of a population of over around 221 million adults in the United States. And about 93 million are estimated to have basic or below basic literacy skills. Now, that number is comprised of an estimated 30 million who are literally below basic and 63 million who are just at basic levels. And when we say just at basic levels, these are people who are able to carry out the simplest of kinds of functions, uh, being able to fill out a bank deposit slip, read a bus schedule, do the most basic things that uh, would occur in their daily lives. But when you get much beyond that, they're at a loss, which means that uh, these are not unintelligent people. And it doesn't mean that they don't work hard and support their families, but it does mean that they are not working at their potential as employees, as parents, or as contributors to our local communities. I had to reflect, it's only been later that I had to reflect on the importance of my parents in my life in becoming literate. My parents were not high school graduates. They had to quit school before they graduated from high school and go to work. But my dad was an exceptional person. My dad could go through a supermarket and he could fill up two baskets and get to the checkout counter and know within 25 cents how much he had in those two baskets. Um, I annoyed him so much trying to get him to tell me 
what Jackie Robinson's batting average was this week that he had taught me how to calculate batting averages so that I could do it on my own. I say this, I used to walk, he worked about 10 blocks from where we lived and I used to, he wor always worked in the evening so I would get off from school when I was very young and I'd walk to work with him and he, we'd talk about various things. And I relate this to you because children learn many, many things outside of school from their parents or their caregivers. And if those parents and caregivers aren't able to relate their experiences in life, uh, what they do in ways that assist that child's living, that child's at a disadvantage. A child who grows up in a home where the literacy skills of the parents are, are uh, caregivers um, are, are uh, at low levels has about a 50% chance of being a low literate adult herself or himself. We need to bear that in mind. Now, one of the things that I try to say to librarians is that we've always been involved in literacy like we've always been involved in education. But in order for us to be more successful in sponsoring literacy programs, we have to steep ourselves more deeply in knowledge and understanding of what happens to uh, learners. Learning to read is difficult for some. Many people, in fact, many adults don't even remember how they learned how to read. It came so quickly and so easily to them, uh, it was almost like magic. And therefore, they have little appreciation for the struggles that some people go through almost their entire lives, trying to decipher uh, things that other people can catch very quickly. We know that this is not an indication of intelligence, and there is a myth that even though a child may struggle with this in early years, they'll grow out of it. No, they don't grow out of it. They become adults with low literacy skills. What we're learning from brain surgeons today, and we have a whole series of resources that are going up on the Pro Literacy website, taken from scientists, from archaeologists, from reading specialists, from historians, to try to give us a more comprehensive understanding of the history of trying to, to develop the code, reading. And what we know from those scientists is that reading is an unnatural act for the human body to perform. You're born with the ability to speak. You're born with the ability to listen and learn to understand what is being spoken around you. You are not born with the ability to decode and read. This is a learned uh, skill, and it really is an indication of how well you will learn in the future. And what those same psychologists are telling us is that at the very early stages, when a child is at that point where they begin to learn to read, they either go into an ascending spiral where reading becomes an effective tool for subsequent learning, or they go into a descending spiral. Just think about it. You're seven years old. It's very difficult to read. You're going to school and you know that every day you're going to go and be forced to participate in that activity that you simply hate because it's so difficult and so painful for you and there's no escape. And that's part of that downward spiral. They begin to react they develop coping mechanisms by acting up in class, uh, by resisting, and other kinds of behaviors that manifest that downward spiral of shame and embarrassment because they are considered dumb by the other kids because they don't catch on to what the other kids seem to catch on so quickly and easily. Now for librarians, comprehension is the, is the key. How to move from decoding to understanding. And what we know is that the only way a young reader uh, becomes a better reader is through constant practice with increasingly more difficult materials. Now, what, could a, what better job mandate could librarians have than being responsible for assisting young readers to get more and more practice with increasingly more difficult materials? That is a part of our role. Now, we know that reading has 
our literacy has evolved from the 20th century. In the first um, half, up to the, through the first half of the 20th century, uh, which was uh, my formative period, uh, reading and writing were quite basic. And what we've come to understand as we've moved into the 21st century is that literacy is a complex set of skills and abilities, and we've, con we've developed the concept of information literacy in our field. Now, I've been concerned about this because as an academic librarian, my academic library specialists in many cases think of information literacy as something separate and, di and, di separate and distinct from what other librarians do. And thanks to um, my longtime colleague, Patricia Bravik, the former university librarian here at uh, San Jose State University, who is the guru on information literacy, we've been able to try to get people to understand that information literacy doesn't just focus on the most uh, advanced scientific and technical literacies. It really is a spectrum of literacies all the way from basic literacy to those most advanced aspects. And there are lots of media literacy um, and, uh, of course, uh, prose document and quantitative literacies are a part of that. So information literacy is a spectrum of literacy. Information literacy adds critical thinking and a willingness to view the process of learning in new and different kinds of ways. So this is how literacy has evolved in my lifetime. Now, ALA defines information literacy um, in the following way. To be information literate, a person must be able to recognize when information is needed and have the ability to locate, evaluate, and use effectively the information needed. Now, the essentials of information literacy are comprised of mastery of certain kinds of skills, experience in applying those skills to real situations, understanding the literacy spectrum, and understanding the challenges and barriers that libraries and librarians face in operating uh, with information literacy. Now, there are some pluses and minuses that libraries and librarians face in dealing with the field of literacy. The pluses are ones that you know well. Libraries are, uh, are really storehouses of learning materials. They have professional staff in virtually all locations. You have learning equipment and facilities and a commitment to advancing literacy in many cases, especially here in California. I like to say to my colleagues that we spent all of the history of libraries through the 20th century developing these large, well-equipped, well-stocked libraries with advanced information systems to allow us to manipulate the records of what we hold and how they can be useful to individuals. And then we get to this and I say, well, so what? Why did we do this? Well, we did it to serve users. And that's the reason I think the 21st century is going to be the age of the user, because we have all of these skills and knowledges, all of these materials that we've developed to put at the disposals of various kinds of users. Now, there are some minuses that we have to address. One is that um, we lack many developmental tools for diagnosing and analyzing the needs of learners in library situations. Now, literacy programs have various kinds of tools that they've developed, but we need to be able to take that person when they come. And each person who comes to you has a story. And it's important for you to listen to that story uh, because that story gives you clues as to how your literacy program can be helpful. And if the person who is conducting that interview is attentive and listening and if they apply these tools, then they can place that person in the right, uh, in the right location. I liked it. One of the first letters that I received when I went to uh, what was then Laubach Literacy in 2000 was a letter from a woman with a $25 check enclosed. And she said, I want to make a small contribution to your organization because I have just returned from the library with my 45-year-old daughter who checked out her first two books. Now, this is a young woman who had undiagnosed uh, hearing and sight problems 
All through her schooling years, she struggled to learn how to read, was unsuccessful, and it wasn't until she got with a tutor that a tutor diagnosed what her problem was, got, recognized that she was having trouble seeing and listening, got her eyesight corrected, and got her to the point where she could actually become a regular library user. There are millions of stories like that, not just in this country, but around the world. We lack measurable objectives, and that's why I'm so excited about what you do in California. You've got continuing funding, but you have to meet objectives for your programs. And we need to be sure that we meet objectives for individual learners. It's amazing what you can find in unexpected places. I was visiting one of our partner programs in Bolivia, and they were taking me. This was sponsored by a radio station, and they were taking me through their operation. They send out people to these local uh, areas to conduct basic literacy programs. And uh, I was touring their headquarters, and the last place I stopped had a group of clerks in there uh, filling out data sheets. Of course, as an old systems librarian, I had to know what that was. <laughs> And I went over and I looked and they had a record for every single learner across the country enrolled in their program, where they started, a current uh, uh, indication of what level of literacy they were at that point, how long they'd been in the program, what their family background was. And I'm saying that's the kind of tool that we need to continue to develop to make our programs more effective. <clears throat> The 2005 National Assessment of Adult Literacy, uh, the statistics are important, but we need to avoid getting lost in talking about those, those statistics. We need to focus on the fact that adult literacy is absolutely essential to children's literacy. As I wrote to President Bush when the No Child Left Behind Act was, uh, was signed, I congratulated him on the No Child Left Behind, but I also pointed out that that act would only be partially successful because for those children who come home every day to homes where the parents or the caregivers have low literacy skills, where there are no newspapers, no books, those children will still be at risk. And that no children's library literacy program <coughs> No children's literacy program can ever be completely successful if there is not a companion adult literacy component with it. Ultimately, literacy is vital for our economy, and that's why we need to think of literacy as a key to the quality of life. And when we talk about the quality of life, we're talking about the ability to support a family, the ability to monitor the health of your family, the ability to participate in your community, to be able to vote and talk about issues that affect the lives of the people in your community. These all contribute to the quality of life. Ultimately, literacy is not about knowledge, and just knowledge, skills, and abilities, but it's the quality of life that literacy enables. And I want to urge you to keep that in mind and congratulate you again and wish you the best in continuing to advance literacy through California libraries. Thank you.